Hello, everyone, and welcome to Move Crush Count. This is the podcast where we learn how achievers are changing business growth strategies. We're here to help you grow your business so we can show you how to move the crowd, crush your competition, and count the money. Today's interview is sponsored by JL Marketing. JL Marketing is a digital and direct marketing agency that delivers results by helping you outsmart your toughest competitors so you don't have to outspend them. The title of today's interview is How Experts Monetize Small Audiences. My name is Scott Joseph. Today I'm talking with lead generation expert Ina Coveney about new developments in the area of lead generation and monetizing small. She likes to refer to them as tiny audiences. Welcome, Ina. Thank you so much for having me. It's such a pleasure to be here, Scott. Uh, I, you know what? We met out at PodFest in Orlando earlier this year. I was a participant in your workshop, and I thought I was listening to everything you were saying, and I was like, this hits home for so many people because, first off, 90, 90, I don't know, I have the exact percentages, but I know it's well over 90% of the people that are involved in social media uh, or using social channels at some point to help them sell more have small audiences. And so it it can be frustrating for them to watch all these big players, the Grant Cardones with the millions of the fo- millions of followers uh, teaching them. But what you're teaching really hits home with so many people. I think it can be helpful. So I'm excited about it. Yeah. And the biggest problem is not that they have a small audience, is that they continue to try to grow it, thinking that is the only way to have an online business. So you end up with so many people. And this is why I do what I do because you encounter so many people who have been trying to grow their audience for so long and they end up burnt out. They end up still not getting clients, still not advancing or moving the needle in their businesses. It's like, "Mm, there's a better way. You just need to reframe what you're going through right now. Um, and, And that's what I'm here to just talk about and tell everybody. Well, when I went through your workshop, I learned a lot. I took a lot of notes. And just so you don't have to toot your own horn, uh, you're a well-known expert. You know, you've been featured on NBC News, USA Today, Business.com. Uh, I already mentioned we met at Podcast or PodFest. Um, you've graciously agreed to share your knowledge, your experience with our audience. So I'm very appreciative of that. Uh, I'm excited about this. I think a lot of people are going to get a lot out of it. Let's jump right in. Is that all right? Yep. Let's do it. I'm ready. All right. So first set of questions is I do want people, I want the audience to understand a little bit about your background and your experience, get to know who you are and how you got started. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and and we'll take it from there? Sure. I was your run of the mill computer science major in college. I wanted to be a developer. I thought I wanted to be a programmer, you know, just making custom applications forever and ever. I thought that was going to be my life. And as soon as I got to corporate, I pretty much right away realized that there was something more that I wanted to do. I didn't know what it was. I I didn't have any examples in my life. I was surrounded by corporate people. And then um, through a series of events, I ran into uh, this crazy online world, online coaching world. And I was fascinated by the fact that you could pretty much do what you want to do, make as much money as you want doing it and have complete independence and not have to work for anybody. So once I discovered that, it was a race to the top, right? It's like, okay, let's see how other people are doing it. So I fell into the same pitfalls that everybody does, right? Okay, you need to grow your audience. Okay, I will. In my first year after I quit my job, um, I invested about $3,000, $3,000, which was serious money for me at the time. But I'm like, oh, it's an investment. This is what I need to do. $3,000 to work with a Facebook ads agency. Because I'm like, yeah, they're going to give me the numbers, right? I just have to come up with a masterclass. They work in their expertise. They'll get me the signups and then I'm rich, right? That, that's how it works. You build the online course, people buy it, you put out ads and you're rich and then you live life like it's a perpetual vacation, right? Like it's a perpetual paid vacation. So So those numbers did not materialize. And there was a good reason for that. I couldn't see it at the time. There was good reason for that. Facebook ads, they work on experience. They work on testing uh, to see, okay, who is really interested in your 
in your content who is watching at least 25% of your videos, right? I didn't have any of that history on Facebook. So clearly, first foray into Facebook ads, it was just a complete flop for me. I, I can see all this in hindsight. I didn't understand this level at the time. I just thought, well, that was a waste of money. I'm never doing Facebook ads again, right? So I kind of went down this path of organic growth. I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm just going to grow completely organically because that's what everybody's telling me to do. In the meantime, I'm getting myself into more and more debt. I am finding myself buying every course out there that portrays itself as being the solution for growing your audience. I bought $5,000 YouTube courses, um, courses on how to make TikToks, right? I worked with mindset coaches. I worked with every coach possible. And at the end of the first three years of my business, I was out of money. I literally ran out of money. I'm like, what happened? I made money in my business. Where did it go? And it was because of this cycle of continuing to chase that golden goose that is the audience growth. That was not happening, by the way. To this day, right now, I think I'm about to hit 1,700 followers on my Instagram. That's where I am right now. And I started this account from scratch. I had zero followers a year ago, right? So I've always had a small audience, but I never counted it as something that would be that that could help me. So I'm like, no, right. what you need is a big audience. I never, I always discounted them. So at the end of those three years, I got angry at myself. I get angry at myself, disgusted at the uh, all the marketing that was being targeted at me to buy all these courses. And I made a decision right then and there that I'm done. I am done spending money. I am done. I need to figure this out. And when I looked back at my three years in business, I had already hit a hundred thousand dollars in revenue in my business for a small business with a small audience. That is like unthinkable. That is like, you know, what everybody's trying to get to do that six figure mark. So I started to really put two and two together and realize, wait a minute, why am I chasing after this audience growth situation and getting myself into that when it appears as though I already know how to make money? I'm just not being great at keeping it because I'm chasing the wrong goals. So that's when everything just started to turn. And that's when I started really hanging on to this idea that I need to tell everybody that will hear my voice that a small audience can be a profitable audience. The only thing you have to do, which is really hard, is stop trying to grow your audience. And let me tell you what, yeah. let me tell you something that is not a popular thing to say. And we're about, and part. we're going to dive into what you exactly mean by that. And this is where it really gets going. I, and I kind of want to just dive right into this because the specifics that you gave during that workshop, like I said, I took pages and pages of notes. I thought it was outstanding. Uh -huh. Um, I Thank think the you. odds, I, I, I think it's what, uh, less than 10% of people on Instagram have 10,000 or more followers. I'm not sure the exact percentage, but I know it's low. Yeah. Um, and who knows how many of those bought them. So, I, I mean, you know, that's a useless thing. So what you're going to do, and let's dive right into this. Why is monetizing and you kind of touched on it a little bit, but I want you to get more specific. Why is monetizing and focusing on a small audience so important? Okay. To answer that question, I feel like I need to clarify something that other people have made the assumption about me about. Uh, I have been on podcasts where people have told me, it seems like you're intentionally trying to keep your audience small. And I'm like, no. That is wrong. I'm not intentionally trying to keep it small. Are you kidding me? I wish I could tell 100,000 followers tomorrow that they can monetize their small audience. No, I'm not trying to keep it small. The goal is not to keep your audience small. The goal is to change your mindset around the audience that you already have. So when we think about having a thousand people following us. And I define a tiny audience as fewer than a thousand followers. So let's say that you have a following of 800, right? In fact, I had a client one time in a coaching call tell me, Ina, I really just don't think 
that my ideal client is in my list of followers. I really don't think they're there. I'm like, why do you think that? It's like, well, it's because when I put offers out or I put content out, they're not engaging with me. So that means that they're not there. I'm like, whoa, let me go to your account. And I'm here expecting to see like, you know, 50 followers, right? Like she can say this with such certainty, right? That I'm like, you must have like such few followers that you know who they are, right? So I go to her account right there on the spot. She has 2,500 followers. And I'm like, are you kidding me right now? How can you be so sure that none of these 2,500 followers are women of a certain age going through a divorce who need your kind of help? How do you know? And it's because people are not engaging with you. That's a joke. So it to answer your question, it's not about the impact importance of having a small audience is the importance of your mindset around how you are thinking about them and how are you drawing conclusions based on things that you know it's really not a cause and effect there could be a million reasons why people are not engaging with her content number one it could be she's not posting often enough which was the case for her she was maybe posting yeah. once a week and she wasn't really being consistent on Instagram stories, for example, right? So if you're not posting consistently, the algorithm is not having enough data to know who is going to like your content and who to push it to, right? So that is just one reason why you could be getting low engagement. Another great reason why you might not be getting very high engagement is how are you engaging with other accounts? Are you out there being social on social? And I, I hate to say the thing that everybody says, but it's true. The algorithm, the platform needs to have a way to figure out who to relate you to and who to suggest your content to. I just had a DM from somebody this past week and I'm like, how do we get connected? How, how did this, did you see me on a podcast? Where did you come from? Like, oh no, the app suggested you to me. I'm like, what? That's a thing? It's a thing. So there could be a million reasons why people are not engaging. Don't jump to the conclusion that it's because they're not your client. All right. So let's let's talk a little bit about what you think might be some of the advantages of having a smaller audience versus because some people listen, I I feel like yeah. my audience is in the mix, right? I've got a little over ten thousand on Instagram, I've got thirty thousand on uh LinkedIn. I don't even know what it is on Facebook. In, yeah. in, uh, and I dumped Twitter. So, but not everybody wants to put in the time and the effort to grow a huge audience, right? So what are some of the advance for the people that have small audiences now, maybe you're struggling and think that their number one focus needs to be building the audience. Let's, let's take a step back and talk about the advantages of having a small audience. There are so many things that you can do with a small audience that big audience entrepreneurs simply can't. They, they cannot do this. Um, I usually tell people, just give the example of how many one-on-one -on -one conversations over DMs have you ever had with Joe Rogan, <laughs> right? Yeah. How many one-on-one -on -one DM conversations have you ever had with Taylor yeah. Swift, right? Like whoever has a huge audience, I'm going to tell you right now, their DMs are blowing up in such a way that it makes it impossible for them to engage personally with their audience. Yeah. With a small audience, when I have clients coming to me and tell me like, I'm, I'm not sure who's in my audience and I see they have 300 followers, I'm like, well, you're about to find out because you can just put those 300 people on a list, a spreadsheet, and just go through them one by one. And yeah. this is kind of the stuff that I get into like you know, when I talk to clients is you need to know who your ideal client is so well that when you go to their profile, you can tell if this is somebody that's going to engage with you, somebody that you want to hang out with, somebody that would find your content appealing. So if I give you 300 accounts, that's nothing, right? you can go through each one of them and see, okay, who are the people that I would like to engage with? So that is something. And then and then actually talk to them and go to their yeah. stories and check out what they're posting about and post a comment on their post. Big accounts have a really hard time getting to that level of granularity because of the sheer level of people that they have. So you are in a great advantage if you realize that your small audience just because it's 300, it sounds like, oh, a big number in terms of spreadsheet rows. It's actually, yeah. it could take you 15 minutes just to 
quickly survey through each one of them and see who is in there. So I would say as me as having a small audience, I get to have such a stronger connection with my audience that I'm mm -hmm. actually scared of losing. I want to have 100,000 followers tomorrow and I'm dead scared of losing that connection and becoming out of touch. How am I going to handle that? that those are my fears. Um, so yeah, with a small audience, start talking to your people and getting to know them personally. So let's, let's you had an interesting uh, exercise or I guess thought process you had us do. It wasn't really an exercise as much as something you wanted us to imagine very early on during that workshop. You, you said, you know, if you could, you, I think you gave us like, if in the next 24 hours you had to sell like uh, three people. I love do, that. Do you remember which one? Of the, yes. Can, can you, I, can, can I, you can I share that? it with yeah, you? Yeah, please. So yes. I love it. I talk about it in my master classes and it blows people's minds all the time, right? Um, you first have to set it up. I ask everybody first, hey, what are the things that you're doing on social media to try to get more traction with your offer? And it's usually things like, well, I'm getting... I'm practicing creating more reels, right? And I'm, I'm talking specifically about Instagram, right? But I'm creating more reels. I am researching hashtags, right? Should I be using 30? Should I be using eight? Oh my goodness, they just said that I should be using five, right? A big one, a small one, a niche one, a personal one. You're researching hashtags. You are buying Facebook ads, right? G getting to a cold audience. You are, ha, this is a good one, creating um, carousels, on Instagram yeah. because you hear, uh -huh. well, Instagram likes it when you keep people on the app. So if your carousel has 10 slides, then you're keeping people on the app and the algorithm is going to favor you, right? So it's first, you know, I list out all these things that people are normally doing. And then I tell them, okay, what if, right? Somebody went to the future and came back and told you, hey, your next three clients are people that already know you. Is people you're in touch with, you already know who they are, they've seen your content. What would you do to find out who those three people are? Uh, some, some smart aleck usually comes and says, well, I would ask them for their name, right? Oh, no, that person didn't write down their names. That person just said, your next three clients are people you already know. The question is, what would you do to start identifying who those three people are? This is a fact. Those three people are there. How do you identify who they are? Yeah. And usually the responses that we get is, well, I would go through my DMs from the past week, right? And start engaging back with people who I was talking to. Um, I've gotten responses like, oh, I would send an email to my personal connections, like people that I know personally and ask them, hey, what is going on and what do you have going on? Um, so the responses start to get really personal, really I, trying to figure out who did I talk to last, right? Who am I already in touch with? And that's when I kind of pull, you know, reveal, like pull the curtain back and I tell them, okay, I want you guys to notice that exactly zero of you said that you would be recording more reels, researching better hashtags, buying ads, or creating better carousels. And that's what usually gets people thinking like, whoa, I never thought about it that way. And that really gets to the, the core belief of in order to monetize your small audience, you have to believe that you already know who your next client is because it is such a small community. So the big mistake that we all make is that because the success stories that bubble to the top are the people who have the big audiences and the big budgets. Those are the examples that we're seeing. So we're like, okay, so if they are doing more reels, more hashtags, more carousels, more ads, and that's what I should be doing. When I'm here with a small audience making the six figures, telling them, well, actually, you just got to believe you already know your client and go out and chat them up and find them. I love the, the, what I take from that immediately is the things that we work on usually the most, probably 80% of the time when it comes down to identifying and potentially monetizing those next three within the 24 hours, none of that is having any impact at all in doing it. And so exactly. I, I love that. And, and it's what woke me up in your, uh, I'm glad I, I 
turn that over to you uh, because I hit it up here, but for me to deliver, it would have been, I would have butchered that. So I'm glad you, you took that over. Well, um, thank you for the opportunity. <laughs> all right. So here you are. I'm, let's pretend you're coaching me. Okay. okay. I'm ready. And what should I do for, I need to monetize my audience. I'm tired of playing around. I'm tired of, you know, whatever I'm selling, it doesn't matter. And by the way, you know, I was down there listening to your workshop because it was a podcast convention. All yeah. right. And you're, t- you're talking to podcasters, but it doesn't, you don't have to have a podcast. You don't, anybody that's on social media at all interacting with whether they, people that follow you, friends, colleagues, uh, you know, people, potential prospects, customers, whatever it might be. What, uh, what I loved about what you were teaching is I believe it applies to anything because it's really about relationship building. Right. right. And so, and, and I'm a big proponent of that. Um, I often say that the biggest regret I have, um, over the, if I had to, if I had to take my first, I've been in business 30 years. If I had to take my first 10 over, the first thing I would do is I obviously built client relationships, which was fine, but I would have also built relationships with uh, peers and colleagues and and people in the industry, maybe not necessarily in the same vertical uh, that could have helped me get to areas or who have already accomplished things I want to accomplish and help me get there in a shorter period of time. And you're one of those people uh, I think can help a lot of people. So let me ask you, what, what advice I want to monetize my audience. What should I do first? Okay. Uh, first, I'm going to caveat this by saying that coaching is not telling someone what to do. Coaching would be, you know, we would actually get into a conversation about what is it that your goals are? Who do you want to talk to? What does your offer look like right now? How much do you know about your ideal client? Should you go back out there and start talking to some of them? So I'm going to, I want to preface that first, yeah. right? But there, this would be a process of coaching. People, but. For the sake, you know, people, you know, people correct me all the time. All right. <laughs> no, I, I, just for the sake, I just want to say, for the sake of this podcast episode, I am going to skip the coaching and I'm going to explain what would, what would be the flavor, yeah. what would be, what would be happening in our coaching call. If you came to t- tell me, Ina, I need, I need to monetize my small audience. What do I do? I would walk you through all those magical exercises of discovery and figure things out. But really, yeah. it comes down to. Is your following actually understanding what you do? And I want you to think about this. Every post that we put out there educates our audience about what we do, basically in three-second increments, right? It's almost like we're trying to get a big message. I mean, Scott, if you were to stand up right now to share with everybody how you can help them and everything you can do, it will take you a lot longer than three seconds to do, right? Especially because there's nuances to it and there's tears to it, right? I can help some people with this, some people with that, right? How do you explain all of that in a way that is comprehensive, that people totally get it three seconds at a time? That's a really hard thing to do. So in our conversation, we probably get into, okay, what is the thing that you want to sell? And even that stumps most people. It's like, yeah. uh, I, I think I have a, I have this program, but I also was thinking about this course, but I also have like a combination of the two, but I also have this low level offer. I also have this tripwire. I'm like, no, no, no. What is it that you want to sell? So we can start reverse engineering, right? Okay, who is perfect for that offer? How do you identify who they are on social media and how you start chatting them up? But I'm going to tell you, I have this philosophy that I teach all of my clients. So we're all working on the same level because it would be completely useless for me to try to convince you to not grow your audience because that's something that everybody wants to do. So I need you to be in the same page with me mentally here that I need you to know that in order to monetize your small audience, there's two things that need to be happening at the same time. And I'm saying this fully understanding that on Instagram, I'm your engagement coach, right? It's all, I I talk all about engagement and relationships, but there's really two sides of what I call the sales coin. If you want to sell something, you need these two things equally. Number one, which we just covered is engagement, right? Is talking to people. And I don't define engagement as likes, 
shares, and comments. I define engagement as how many conversations are you getting into, okay? So when somebody Beautiful. comes and asks you, right? Hey, yep. how, how's your engagement? And you respond, yep. well, like, well, people are not engaging with my post. You saw me say that in the, in the class. I'm like, well, boo-hoo, right? <laughs> what are you doing to talk to people, right? Yeah. So I define engagement very different than everybody else. Engagement is conversations. So that's one side of that sales coin. The other side is your content. Because you know one thing that I'm not going to do so that I can sleep well at night, so that I feel good about my social media presence, is I don't make it a point to go cold selling on DMs. If you or anybody right now who's listening to the sound of my voice, if you go find me on Instagram, your engagement coach, and you send me a DM, we're probably going to talk until we become best friends. But I'm not going to sell you anything on the dms unless you're actually coming and telling me well actually Ina, can i learn more about what you do wait yeah. i'm actually having this problem i may be able to offer some solution i may be able to guide you in the right direction but i like to keep an open mind when i'm on the dms right because like you said you know you wish you could go back to your first decade and establish more relationships with peers i do too I want to establish relationships with peers. So every DM conversation that I have, I keep a very open mind. This person is not just here to become my client. And that is not my mission in life to turn this person. It is my mission in life to see how we can help each other out, to see what are you here in the world for? What is it that you need? Let me see if there's anything I can do for you. In many cases, it's just, hey, we have similar audiences. We have complementary products. Let's share audiences. Let's introduce each other to each other's audiences. And those convers those collaborations have worked out beautifully. So I never go into a DM conversation assuming that person is my ideal client, first of all. But anyway, I was talking about engagement and content. So the reason I was telling you this about not selling on the DMs is because if I'm not selling on the DMs, then where am I selling? Where am yeah. I educating people? And it has to be through my content. So we were talking about coaching you on monetizing your small audience. Great. Number one, you need to be chatting with people. You need to actually show genuine interest in getting to know your audience. You actually have to care about yeah. getting to know them. While that's happening, I want your content to be tip-top shape. I want anybody who comes to your page to know what you do, and how you do it, and how you can help me with it. And there is this concept that I, I've been thinking about. I don't think it's a, a, an exact analogy, but it's how I picture it. Are you familiar with the, um, I don't know what the name of the game is, like Atari game, it's like Guardians of the Galaxy or something, where you have the little... That's a movie. <laughs> Guardians of the Galaxy is a movie. What is the name? Like... Ga uh, Gal Gal uh, I know it. You know uh, what I'm talking about. Galactica or something like that. Something, something yeah. like that, where you have yeah. this little, this Galaxy, little guy... Yeah who is shooting who is shooting up to the top of the screen and then you have the aliens coming down right, right. and you have to shoot at them before they come and space get you. invaders okay space invaders that sounds right okay right. space invaders so the way that i think about your content is like the space invaders game where you are this the the little guy who's shooting at the bottom of the screen and your audience is the aliens coming down if your content is skipping from one side of the screen to the other, talking about, hey, today I went out with my dog and then comes back to the other side. Oh, and by the way, I have this offer. And then it goes to the other side saying like, hey, so I went to a fair yesterday and then, oh, look what I did today. If your audience comes down and you are not there to meet them where they're at, they're going to go right past you. You see, I said it wasn't an exact analogy, but that's how I think about it. They're all coming at me. What am I going to be talking about when they finally meet me there? Are they going right. to find me talking about what I did with my kids today? Or are they going to find me talking about monetizing small audiences and the fact that I have a program right here that can help you with it? If they yep. see me talking about my kids, which is great, by the way. I post about my kids all the time. It was my kid's birthday this past weekend, and we had a wonderful weekend, and I posted all about that. But in my content, in my feed, you were learning about monetizing small audiences. You were learning about my podcast. I was teaching you a little bit more about engagement. There is no way 
to miss my message in what I post. So your content has to be there and it has to be there all the time. It cannot be just posting once a week. It has to be there all the time with the exact right message. So if I were to coach you, Scott, those are the two things I'm going to be looking for. Are you talking to enough people every week to get to know them? Not selling them. I do not condone or like or enjoy the cold selling, right? You're just getting to I know them, either. right? Nobody does. Can't stand God, nobody that. does. Nobody yeah. does. Nobody likes that. And number two, let me take a look at your content. Are your offers clear? Is your bio clear? Those are the two yeah. things I'd be asking you to really look into. So I've heard you say before, uh, and I, I love this approach because I, I, I do not like a victim mentality. I don't, I don't deal well with that. So what do you mean when you say engagement is not something you wait for? Oh because yeah. I think that's, I think that's probably one of the most common mistakes. Right. Um, and this comes from what we were just talking about of people saying, well, but Ina, nobody's engaging with my content. What do I do? I'm like, well, woohoo. Like, like, so this is where I go. You need to take control of your engagement. So when you post and then wait to see, okay, let the likes and the comments and the shares pour in, pour in and they don't come, then you end up feeling defeated. Like, yeah. what happened? What happened with my content? Ina, can you check my content to see maybe it wasn't right? Maybe he didn't hit the right chord. I'm like, why do you care so much about whether people are commenting or not? Why do you care? <laughs> why is this a thing out there? I don't worry about it. I post yeah. two to three times a day on Instagram, right? So two when I like, so when I like your content, I'm wasting my time. No, you're be, not wasting. <laughs> I appreciate the love, Scott. But you might not be my ideal client. You may be hitting like, which is what happens a lot. You may be hitting like because you like me. Because you're like, oh, I want to support Ina. Let me give her a like, right? Correct. And, that, and, and I support your message, right? And so it's not, it's right. also, it's you and it, I support the content because I think it it's, it's on point. So let's, I want more people to see it, right? Right. So you go and Richard. you like it, and I appreciate it. I don't want to sound like I am not appreciative of my likes and comments. I am. I totally am. But I'm going to tell you right now, I 100% prefer, 100 prefer a DM. If yeah. you were, if you saw something that you liked on my feed, send me a DM and be like, you know yeah. what? That, that one actually hit me. And we can start a conversation like human beings, right? It's like, right. oh, my God, like you're, you're a person. You're not just a yeah. like. So. And I, I had a client one time who was continuously asking about this, like, how do I get more likes? How do I get more comments? And I kept asking her, why do you care so much? How many conversations are you actually having? So this is a, a mentality that I really try to, to give to my clients as a gift is engagement is not something you wait for. Engagement is something that you start. Engagement is what you do to connect with others. So if you're telling me that your engagement is not good, it's because you are not doing your job at starting those conversations and being a human on social media to get to know your followers. What are two or three things that you would advise that best conversations start, best way to start those conversations? How would you advise people? <laughs> I love this question so much. Um, you saw me. I just got super, super excited. Um, so this is the best part of the stuff that I teach is that, and, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to preface like why this is so exciting for me is because I know that there are a lot of people out there learning the wrong way to start the DM conversations. And I know this because I'm the recipient of those conversation starters right? Yeah. Is the conversation starter like, hi, how are you? Or is the conversation starter of like, hey, thanks for the follow. Or yeah. is the conversation starter of, um, hey, I have a Facebook group and I think you'd be perfect for it. Come and join it, right? Um, hey, so um, what are your offers like? Do you do one-on-one -on -one or a group? And I look at their profile. I know that they're just trying to sell me something, right? Like they're trying yeah. to like, they pretend that they could be a client when really that they're trying to make me into a client. Uh, there's conversations that actually sometimes go for longer. And I'm there's nothing worse than that, that when they try to act like they want to be a client, but really there's the, right. you know, it's like, don't, don't do that to people. I don't do that to people. Right. Um, yeah. And I, and I, 
teach about engagement and I'm like, hey, you know, go to your ideal client and, and post a comment on their post. Yep. I always tell my clients, if that person is selling something in that post, skip that post. You're not here to pretend to be something you're not. You're not here to pique their interest in the wrong way. You're here to create a connection and you don't want yep. them to get the wrong impression. So we were talking about uh, how to start a conversation. So I've been the recipient of this. Sometimes the conversation goes for longer and you're waiting for the pitch. And you're like, when is it going to come? Just just drop it already. Just what is it? What is it that you want from me? Because it starts to get like dragged like that. So I'm going to tell you my favorite way to engage because it, it comes from the heart. It's not like just like a, a strategy. It's not just a method. It's I actually get to see your profile, get to see your stories, get to see who you are and what you do in life. And I make it a point to see if there's something that I can connect with in your profile. Scott, if I look at your profile and I don't connect with it, I'm not going to try to engage with you because right. I already know that my intentions are not pure, right? I already know that the only reason I'm messaging you is because I want you to buy something from me and that doesn't feel good to me. But if I see that, Scott, you just went to, I love this example, but um, like you just went to Disney World, right? And you took your kids. And I'm like, I've actually been wanting to take my kids back to Disney World. My my little one, my four-year-old, who's turning five tomorrow, actually, he hasn't been to Disney World yet. So I may send you a message to be like, hi, Scott. Uh, first of all, I noticed that you were following me. So thank you for the follow. Um, I just saw that you just went to Disney World. How were the lines? Did you get the the access, the all access pass, because I've never gotten it before. I just want to know if it's worth it. Can you tell me, like, should I plan this trip or not? That's a conversation starter. That's something you can be like, oh, wow. Like, yeah, actually the lines were not bad or the all access pass was totally worth it or it wasn't, don't waste your money. That's something we can start a conversation and now we can start bonding. Like, oh, so how old are your kids and how old are mine? Because I'm not interested. In, and this is the next question. It's like, okay, Ina, that's great. But then how do I get this person talking about finance? How do I get this person talking about career development, right? The thing that I'm selling. I'm like, you don't. So you're, let me you're, ask you a question. Why yeah. do the computer, why do you think, because I love that example. I love that, that you're getting more of a personal thing. There's nothing involved in business. People will answer that all day long. Right. Why are there, why are these computer generated messages? Oh. I'm, I'm okay with a computer generated message. If someone wants to do that, but how could they be so ignorant to start with, where do you live? When every social media profile has the city where you live, it just all it says is scream. You didn't even look at my profile. You didn't look at my profile. I don't profile. understand that. So usually people will do something like that, like automate the process of engagement if they feel like they are getting too many, too many. I don't even understand that because if you're getting too many inbound DMs, you're gonna hire a VA to sort through them and kind of tell you what to respond with, but not to initiate. So I really right. feel like people who are hiring agencies or VAs to initiate conversations are doing a huge disservice to their business. Um, how? And, and we're talking about small audiences, so presumably I am here addressing a small audience entrepreneur base. How, how, how busy are you that with a small audience, you can't even make the time to just start these conversations. Now, I don't want to judge anybody. I am very busy. I have a lot of stuff to do, but it just doesn't work as well. It's just something that you need to know. If you're going to outsource this stuff, it's just not going to work as well. And it, you so, might as well just make a little bit of time to be genuine yourself. So if I'm hearing you right, with the, what makes your process work well and it's easy to do with a small audience because you can you have more time to be personal and get to know the people right yeah. is you're sitting there saying in a nutshell i'm talking to them and establishing a really a real relationship the best you can on social through dms right but naturally when these people do it they're going to click on whether depending on the platform your news feed your whatever uh and they're going to see your content. And you're educating them through that. And 
you're not forcing it on them. They're doing that naturally. And so, and by the, by the way, since you're the one initiating these conversations, you get to pick and choose who you want looking at those. Correct. You just graduated. A- <laughs> you graduated from monetizing as well. Cause that's really, you just described it beautifully. Everybody needs to go back 10 seconds and listen to what you just said all over again. Bravo. I am great at describing other people's marketing <laughs> programs and horrible at describing my own. It's amazing how it works. Aren't we all? Aren't we all? <laughs> you just did an amazing job at illustrating what happens in this dual world that I'm talking about, the content and the engagement yeah. world. Because as I'm talking to you about Disney, you're going to be like, oh, she seems nice. Let me go to her profile. And this is where the space invaders analogy comes in. When you, at that point in time, how many chances am I going to get for you to to make a first impression with you, right? Right. So where is my space invader guy going to be? All the way over there talking about something that doesn't make any sense? Or is it going to be here teaching about small audiences? And if you, Scott, look at my profile and you say, wow, small audiences? I have a small audience. I've been having a little bit of trouble monetizing it. I'm going to continue to see what she has going on. Let me see her stories. Let me see what she's doing. Let me see that podcast. And you are going to start to get curious naturally. If I'm doing my job right, I yeah. never even have to mention it in that conversation about Disney. So when does it somewhat switch? When do, is there ever time in those conversations? And I'm sure you don't force it, but describe some more natural settings where you might say, Hey, I didn't, you know, if you're interested in this workshop or if you're interested in this webinar or whatever, I don't, when do you turn the conversation? Whenever they have made and they have taken an action to dive deeper with you. Okay. Cause I could yep. be talking to you all day long. All right. And we'll talk about Disney. We'll talk about our kids. We'll commiserate about the weather. Right. We'll we'll just talk about things just like human people talk about and just start to like each other. Right. We'll start following each other. We'll start commenting on each other's stuff. If you like my content, if you and I don't I'm sorry, let me just nuance that. I don't mean you clicked hard on one of my posts. That's not what I mean with like my content. I mean, you actually resonate with small audiences maybe you will go and download my freebie, which is on my bio. Maybe you will sign up for my masterclass. Maybe you'll sign up for the wait list for my program. When you take that action, it's totally fair game for me to come back to my buddy whom I was talking to about Disney and be like, oh my God, I just noticed you signed up for the wait list. What made you do that? What's going on right now? Oh, well, I thought it was interesting because you said this and this and this. That is so cool. Let's like, let's talk more about this or, okay, I'll see you in the masterclass. By the way, let me give you a, a pro tip, right? You will want to keep an eye on emails because everybody in the wait list gets uh, the best pre-sale deal. Just keep an eye on it. I'm telling you right now. Okay, okay, okay. Sounds good, right? That's when you start to really talk about business. But again, you and I, Scott, could be talking for a year and I will yeah. never feel any pressure to sell to you because you know what I'm doing. If it doesn't resonate with you, who am I to come and be pushing it on you? And that's what people hate. I don't like being targeted that way. So I don't do it to people. So you know what my job is? To make friends in the online world. Like what better job than that? It's just to go out there and make friends and not feel anything, any, any pressure at all about whether this conversation is going right. And I'm doing air quotes whether it's going right or not. I don't have to worry about it. And I want to put, I want to clear something up real quick. This doesn't mean you've got to wait a year or two before you start selling deals and start getting, that's not how, what you're, you're not suggesting that because you're all about, listen, if you have a small audience, you basically are teaching people, you need clients now. That's how yeah. you fund growth. That's how you, you, you can't sit there and keep spending and, and investing time and time and time and never getting clients. So what you're proposing is this is a better and faster way to get clients, even though some of the examples you're giving like the year, you know, those are just certain exa- That's just certain situations. We haven't even talked about putting your offer out there. So. Yeah. All we've talked about in the past 45 minutes is how to create relationships, 
and how to make sure that your content is not missed, like in Space Invaders, right? That's what, all we what? talked about. But, all right. So, hey, I know that you have a tight schedule. All right. But so I need, I need to, let's get to the on, call to action. I need to tell you this. I need yeah. to tell you this because I don't want everybody to walk away from this thinking like, wait, but how, how am I going to get clients any faster? Yeah. We haven't even talked about putting your offer out there. There, yeah. what you should be doing with your content is speeding up that process by making offers like, do I am a huge fan of doing launches. And I know there's a lot of people out there who are not fans of launching is too much work, too little return. All a launch is, is a promotion, is bringing attention, as much attention as possible to something that you're doing. So launches is really at the, like, once you cover everything that we've been talking about for the past 45 minutes, when you're going through a process of launching offers, it kind of boosts that the value of your content. It boosts that the effect that your content has on people. So yes, we could be talking for a year, but if in the meantime, I have been doing launches consistently and it's still not grabbing your attention, who am I to say that you were ready for my offer, that you were my right. ideal client? I'm not going to make those assumptions. That's why I don't feel right. any pressure on it because while we're having this conversation for a year, there's other people who hire me after one day. Right? right. So I'm just advocating for patience because I don't want you to think it, what so many people think that I don't want to waste my time on DMs if it's not going to give me a result. You have to get that completely out of your head in the game of monetizing a small audience because it's going to make you desperate. It, people are going to smell it right there in the conversation, just like we smell it when other people DM us. And we cannot have that energy in there. So you got to be infinitely patient, have no expectations, and trust that the launch process and using your content right is going to draw the right client to you. And the more conversations you're having, the more people who like you are going to pay attention. If they are your ideal client, they will be signing up for your offers. Uh, you know, I'm going to take this to sales real quick. If I was to ask a bunch of salespeople, what makes a good closer? You'd be shocked. You probably, you wouldn't be shocked, but a lot of people would sit there and say, well, you, you know, you got to ask for the deal, right? And here's all the different closes that I can use. What makes an effective closer is two things. Being, making sure that you recognize that the client or prospect is actually sold to begin with. And knowing when to close. And that's really what you're talking about here is recognizing when to close. Let's jump in because I know you only got about 10 more minutes. So I want to know your call to action. So, let's, so now we're getting people to this point, right? What are some mm -hmm. of the, and by the way, I don't, did you see my shirt? Move crush count. Yes. Do you, we're going to send you one of these, by the way. Yay. Right. Extra small, please. <laughs> All right. Extra small. And, uh, I am going for the, this thing will air soon, but I'm going to do it for the lot people live. And then when we drop it as a podcast as well, first 10 people that reach out to me through direct message, whether it's on Instagram, LinkedIn, or Facebook, I will send a free move crush count shirt. All right. And I don't know if you recognize where I learned that, but <laughs> I, I don't, but I love it. Oh yeah. Yes, you taught me that. I so, taught you this. I am yeah, so I smart. <laughs> that is awesome. That is All awesome. Right, so, and and make sure that you continue those conversations. You get those DMs and you get to know each other. So everybody yeah. who's listening, ask Scott a personal question. When you send him the DM, it's going to be awesome. Hold on here. I am getting, this is not my phone. I oh, know. There we go. <laughs> that is not my phone ringing. All right. So let me ask you a question real quick. What are some of the call to actions, the most effective call to actions in this type of process? If you really know your ideal client, you know what they want. And sometimes it's not the same as what they need. So a great call to action is going to be whatever is going to get that person to say yes 
even if sometimes it's not what you think they need, because you need to have the opportunity to explain to them what the difference is between what they asked for and what you really think is going to move the needle. And that is what's going to set you up as an expert. So I'm going to give you a clear example. I am on Instagram, your engagement coach, right? So I talk about engagement. So I teach my people how to get more engagement. I have a freebie. They can go download 100 engagement post ideas, right? But then in that process of now that they're in my sphere, like, okay, I'm going to get the 100 ideas so that I can get higher engagement. Now they're in my circle where they can hear this message. They can hear me saying, hey, engagement is not what you think it is. Engagement is this other thing. And by the way, how's your content? So now that they're in, I get to explain in more with more time, with emails, with master classes, with going live on Facebook, live on Instagram, with my posts, I can explain better. Now that I have their, their little attention, I'm going to give it to them the three seconds at a time, the 10 minutes at a time, the 15 minutes at a time. And I spend all of my time trying to explain to them how to go from A to B, from thinking that engagement is the problem to realizing, no, wait, do you know what you're doing online? Are you starting conversations and is your content up to par? So that's what you want to be doing. Figure out what is it that they want and spend all your time explaining the bridge between that and what they actually need. Nice. So give me a call. Give me some call to actions. All right. So now here I am. You want to, you want to, uh, I, you gave some really good uh, examples when, when, when down in Orlando and I, I loved it. Uh, I just used one. Yeah, of them, I gave right? everybody. I gave everybody. Yeah. And you just used one of them, right? Uh, yes. hey, yeah. Hey, come and send me a DM. Um, I am a huge fan of getting people into your mailing list. So give them that call to action of, hey, go to this link and sign up for this. Another one that you can do that I love is anything that can get them to start a conversation with you on the DMs right? Yeah. Like if you have a podcast, you can say, by the way, I am torn between talking about small audiences or more engagement tips next time. Send me a DM and I'll tally the votes and you get to pick what I'm going to talk about next time. So that'd be another example. Anything that can get anybody to DM you is a great call to action with a small audience. Yeah. That's why I do it. It's been working very well, by the way. Yay! That's awesome. <laughs> I want that t-shirt. I want to DM yeah, you. You're getting it. You get a t-shirt. So, <laughs> all right. So is there anything, any final thoughts that you want to talk about to help motivate the business leaders out there, entrepreneurs? It could be individual salespeople when it comes to lead generation um, or how to create better opportunities for engagement. Sure. The one thing and that what I'm, I'm, how I'm defining engagement is actual conversations. Actual conversations. The one yeah. thing that I'm going to really say out there is that monetizing a small audience doesn't mean that you are necessarily giving up on audience growth. It just means that audience growth is not going to be your yeah. main focus until you really figure out how to monetize the audience that you already have. Once you start to get clients on a consistent basis because you got your process down. And by the way, I come from a project management background, so I need steps. I need to know that if I'm going to go through one, two, three, four, five steps, I'm going to get clients at the end. So once you have that repeatable process, it's time for audience growth and have fun with it. So I, I just wanted to go down on the record to say, I'm going to teach you how to monetize your small audience, but there will be a time for you to delve into audience growth. And that is once you figure out how to monetize your current audience, because imagine when the floodgates open, if now you know what process will get you clients, all you need is more eyes on that yeah. offer. So I well, want to kind of reframe everybody. And I think, gosh, if you've got that, that part that you said is more important, that priority nailed down, I would think that you'd be better at building not just the audience, but the right audience. Right, right. Yeah. So, and this is something you're going to see a lot and you might not even notice it that, and this is something that I, I saw in somebody that I have been following for a really long time. She grew her audience exponentially over a few years 
And it, I mean, her launches were epic. She had thousands of people signing up for her challenges and for her master classes. And recently, her number of followers have gone down, like to the tune of like losing 10,000 followers over the last year. Like not only is she not growing, but it's contracting. And that is not a bad thing. That actually makes total sense because over the past year, she has actually pivoted her message. She doubled her prices on the, on the offer. She started targeting a more niche market. And it makes perfect sense that the audience right. that used to be there for a more um, of a mass market kind of offer, right? It started to go away because they were not interested in what she's doing right now. But the people who are there, they are paying prime dollar to continue to work with her. So the size of your audience, it doesn't always just go up. As long as you have the right people in there, the more niche you are, the smaller the audience is going to be. And that is okay. It's a factor of things you should expect it. Just know how to continue to monetize the audience you already have. Yeah, that's good stuff. So I want to thank Ina Kovne for an incredible interview. Awesome job. I love Thank it when you, someone Scott. comes on. Oh, I love it when someone comes on the job or on the show and they give us specific tips and advice that we can apply in the real world and actually use right now uh, yeah. and have an immediate impact. That's what I want. And so, you know, uh, you were specific and, and good stuff here. And I think anybody that's trying to grow their business, their sales, whatever can apply. It doesn't matter what they do. And that's when I approached yeah. you after the workshop, I was like, this applies to any, anybody selling anything. Yeah. Um, and, and so I loved it. Uh, can you tell us before you go a little bit more, uh, about the global phenomenon.com? Yes. So right. I have a podcast, it's called The Global Phenomenon, and it is for online coaches, for solopreneurs who want to learn how to monetize their audiences. And I interviewed the top coaches in the world. I've had Laura Belgrade, John Lee Dumas from Entrepreneurs on Fire, Pat Flynn uh, come through the doors. And so you get to learn about their true startup story. I always ask them, what was it like when you had a small audience, right? What was it like when you were starting out? That's great. So those are the stories you're going to hear in The Global Phenomenon. And I also awesome. have a, usually a companion episode. So there's two episodes per week, an interview. And then I go up and teach you, solo episode, how to do this, how to take what they said and apply it to your life so that ah, your nice. business can grow. So that is that happens every single week. Go and check it out. It's called The Global Phenomenon, which is really speaking to the online coaching industry has really <laughs> opened up our world uh, yeah. to a brand new way of survival, of making money, of, of doing what we love. So, um, yeah, I'd like to invite everybody to go and subscribe. That's awesome. Thank you very much. So I want to thank you again for joining us. Thank you for sharing all this knowledge. Uh, I want to thank the MCC Nation for joining us uh, for an amazing presentation. Uh, I want you to make sure you follow and subscribe Move Crush Count. You can do that at movecrushcount.com as well as following us on YouTube, Instagram, Twitter. Join our groups on Facebook uh, and LinkedIn where, Ina, we're going to ask you to join those groups uh, in case you get some questions and, and you can reply Absolutely. on there as well and, and hopefully get some DMs and start some more conversations. That would do me be a favor, lovely. everyone. Yes. Do me a favor, everyone out there in the audience. Share this episode. All our growth comes from people like you who recommend our show uh, or a specific episode to your friends, your family, your colleagues. So please share it. Today's interview was sponsored by JL Marketing. JL is a digital and direct marketing agency that delivers results with strategies that help you outsmart your toughest competitors so you don't have to outspend them. JL is going to give you a freebie. All right. So we're going to give you an online espionage report. This is free. And this happens to the first seven people who private message me. So now you get two things here. You get the move crush count shirt and you get the free espionage report. You got to message me either on LinkedIn, Instagram, or Facebook messenger. I want you to imagine for a moment what would happen if you could spy on your toughest competitor. All right. Your prospects, maybe even your own company without spending any money or any time uh, doing so. So if, if you want to dominate today online, 
It's critical that you know which offers and ads are working best against you, which ads are stealing market share from you, and where your biggest opportunities for growth are. So j and Marketing's online espionage report. It's going to save you a ton of time and money. You'll receive insights that deliver the most actionable, tactical, and timely digital marketing tips you need to move the crowd, crush your competition, and count the money. So private message me ASAP. I'm Scott Joseph, and thanks for joining us on Move, Crush, Count. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks.